Thank you. So uh, the short answer to your question is that I don't think God plays dice, but he might be playing chess, is the, is the short answer. Uh, but I hope it will become clear during this presentation. Um, what I'm going to try to squeeze in, uh, in, uh, in less than an hour is actually almost 20 years of work. Um, that's uh, something I've been working on for, uh, for, uh, for really uh, a, a long time. Uh, and I'm going to present it to you in the order in which things happened, meaning that it's first game theory, that then extended into quantum theory in quite a, a, a very natural way. Um, so what I'm going to do on, on this journey to try to convince you that Einstein might actually have been right is start with game theory uh, and introduce you to an alternative way of doing game theory to Nash equilibrium. Who knows John Nash? Many of you, right? And so I call it non nashian uh, but just like we say non-Euclidean geometry, right? It's not against John Nash, on the contrary, it's a tribute to him. Um, and then I'll go into quantum physics. All right, so let's start with, uh, with the game theory 101. So I'll start with the mainstream, right? The, the first, the, the, the one that everybody accepts. So what is game theory? Um, it is a way of modeling the interaction between agents that we consider to be logical and rational. So in that, uh, in that uh, uh, talk, I will take uh, Peter and Mary. Sometimes I call them Alice and Bob, but Peter and Mary seem to have been introduced by Jean-Pierre Dupuis at Stanford that I worked a little bit with, so uh, I kept this habit. Um, and in that case, the prisoner of dilemma says that these two persons can either cooperate with each other or uh, defect and not cooperate with each other. Um, of course, that in, in itself is not enough to specify a game, uh, in order to specify a game, I can do it in this way. This is one of the main two ways of modeling a game, and I'll show the other one a bit later. This is called a game in normal form. Why? Because we have a matrix. We have here Mary's choice, defect or cooperate, and then we have Peter's choice, defect or cooperate. Think of them as being in separate rooms. Um, they each have to make a choice. Of course, they can think about what the other person is likely to do. Um, and what happens is that once they make a choice, for example, Mary's choice could be to cooperate and Peter's choice to be would be to defect, they land here. And the two numbers we have here is on the left, what goes to Mary, and on the right, what goes to Peter. You can think of these as Swiss francs, uh, but it's actually called the utility. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly uh, uh, money, but basically we assume they want to have as high as possible. Uh, uh, in terms of what we call rational preferences, right? So this is called the, uh, the a game in normal form, right? So far, so good. So now uh, there's a whole theory that was developed by John Nash on how we actually solve these games or how we, we explain what people uh, will or should do. And the idea is this. Um, I'm going to take uh, Mary's place and think, what should I do? And I'm going to do it in two steps. First, I assume, okay, imagine that Peter in the other room is choosing to defect. So I'm going to lock on that and then optimize. And then I'm going to do the same thing with cooperate. Well, when I do that, I should look at the left number, right? Because I'm Mary, so I should be interested in what I'm getting, which is on the left. And then I compare only vertically. Very, very important, vertically. Um, because if on the other room, Peter is actually defecting, then depending on what choice I make, I'm going to get one if I defect and zero if I cooperate, holding Peter's choice as fixed. So of course I should defect, right? If Peter defects, I should defect. But if Peter cooperates, what should I do? Well, here I get three instead of two, I should also defect. So it's a coincidence that in that game, we in both cases we should defect, not always the case. But when it happens that no matter what the other does, if I fix it, I should uh, always do the same. That's called the dominant strategy. That's uh, what, what we call it. So it, in other words, defect is the best response both the to the opponent defecting and to the opponent cooperating. So it seems to be logical, and that's uh, what, uh, what uh, the Nash equilibrium says, what John Nash would have said, is that since whatever the opponent does, my best response is always to defect, then I should just defect, right? Um, now you notice the game is symmetric, right? It's exactly the same thing for both players. Uh, it's, uh, it's totally symmetric, so I can make exactly the same argument for Peter. So Peter should also defect. So what's the result of that? Mary defects, Peter defects, and we have a Nash equilibrium. And again, how do I define the Nash equilibrium? Knowing this, none of them have an interest to change what they are doing or to deviate. Why? Mary could change to here, she would get less. 
Peter would change to here, he would get less. This is an equilibrium. They both stay here and they defect. But you probably see the problem, right? Because they are here and they are missing an opportunity where both of them would have gotten something better. It's called the Pareto improvements. So it's a bit sad, right? That we are stuck in here in a Nash equilibrium. That's why it's called the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, and uh, we would have gotten something better if we had both cooperated. This is John Nash, by the way. Um, all right. So is there any other way to think about this? Um, and here we enter the universe of non-Nashian game theory, just like non-Euclidean geometry. It's a completely different way of reasoning. And uh, the earliest account that I found of this kind of reasoning actually dates back to 1983. And uh, it's due to Douglas Hofstadter, who read Gödel et Scherbach, the book, some of you, Pulitzer Prize, so very, very talented. And he had a brilliant idea by, uh, back in uh, 1983. So this is uh, uh, Douglas Hofstadter. Um, and Douglas Hofstadter th thought in the following way. The game is symmetric, so the two players should anyway make the same choice, right? Even in the Nash equilibrium, they make the same choice. They both defect. So basically, if the game is symmetric, we can take as granted that they will make the same choice anyway. They will never be in a situation like uh, one defect, the other cooperates, or vice versa. So that means th that we can kind of eliminate from the very beginning these two. It's kind of a higher level of thinking that we already know they will pick the same. And then we optimize like this on the diagonal. And every one of them prefers to pick two rather than one, right? Uh, and this means that the equilibrium that's called super rationality, in that case defined for symmetric games, gives you uh, two, two. Now we are, we are a Pareto optimal. Uh, we cannot improve that, right? So. Uh, this, uh, this was the contribution made uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 1983. We will get into the details of this idea uh, of, uh, of the, because it might be surprising or counterintuitive at first, right? If you, if you are trained to think uh, as Nash equilibria, it has to do with the notion of free choice. What's very important here is to understand that this two here, when you think I cooperate and she cooperates, uh, if I had defected, the other would have defected as well. This is a conditional tense that's called a counterfactual dependency, right? So it's the subjunctive mood right there. And I'm giving you an example to, to make the difference between causal and counterfactual in the sense that here is the indicative mood. Uri Schwitz and Unterwald signed a pact in Zollhunder uh, Tainonimsk uh, because the Habsburg tried to invade their region. That's the indicative mood. In the counterfactual uh, subjunctive mood, we say if Uri Schwitz and Unterwald had not signed the pact, then Switzerland would not exist as it is today. It's counterfactual because I'm considering some hypothetical parallel worlds in my imagination that could have happened. And this can really be recognized with the subjunctive mood. And this is what I said when I said we both cooperate because if I had not cooperated, the opponent would also not have cooperated. This is why the diagonal. And I would like to show you this, because this dates back to 1930, I think 1935, around this, the, uh, the famous uh, einstein podolsky rosen paradox was a paper published back then. And uh, I noticed here, because I was curious, this here is a subjunctive tense. And I think it's uh, not a coincidence. So it's somehow, the, the this is done right, right? When we are uh, looking at alternate experiments we could have done, then this should be spoken in English and in terms of the subjunctive conditional. And they also have something very interesting because the word change sometimes, maybe I will have a, a, a bit time to explain why it should be, one should be very careful using the word change when considering hypothetical different choices. No real change can take place in the second system in consequence. Why? Because it's not in the future, right? So you can only impact things that are in your future. Uh, all right, but this is just, all I wanted to show to you is the subjunctive conditional in there. So you see the difference between Nash and Hofstadter. So the, these two approaches is really in the structure of in which we compare the numbers, right? In Nash, we are really locked horizontally or vertically. And in Hofstadter's case, we are looking through the diagonal. And this is why the, the, the concept of a Nash equilibrium or the Nashian reasoning is tied to the concept of free choice in the sense that I can freely change my strategy free in the sense of locking the opponent's strategy, 
while for the glass of Stator, it's not free in that sense, it's uh, just a weakened version, right? But I'll come back to that. So far, so good? The difference between the two? All right. Uh, so this is why we have these two different results, because in that case, we're compa comparing like this, and in this case, we're comparing diagonally. All right. Uh, that was the game theory 101, four games in normal form, people in separate rooms. Now I'm going to move on to something else that usually is what I start with when I explain this line of research uh, to other people. It's called the Newcomb's Paradox. And in a way, the Newcomb's Paradox is the Schrodinger scat of free choice. Uh, and this is actually, you know, it was already thought uh, in this way back then wh when I started working on this, which was already giving a hint that something is going on with quantum. So let me just directly tell you. Who knows the Newcomb's, para Newcomb's problem or Newcomb's paradox? Some of you. All right. So this paradox, just like Schrodinger's cat, is basically bring us to bringing us to our scale the concept of quantum superposition. In the Newcomb problem, we bring to our scale the concept of predicting what people do when they have free choice. So there is this apparent contradiction, right? Uh, if somebody predicts what I'm about to do and already knows what I'm about to do, am I still free to do what I want if it's already been predicted, right? So that's kind of a tension here, right? Wh which side is the stronger, right? Between being free of choosing what I want and being predicted in my choice. So here's the paradox. There are two boxes in front of you. In one box, there is either a million dollars or zero, but you don't know because the box is closed and you cannot see through it. But in the other box, it's open and you see that there is a thousand dollars, right? So either this or this, the two boxes. And you are given the choice between either taking one box, this one, and you get whatever is inside, or the two boxes and you get everything that is inside, right? So either just this one, or the two of them. As you might imagine, there is a catch, because otherwise it would be too easy, right? So here's the catch. Um, somebody in the past, there's many ways of defining this, could be one of your best friends who knows you very well, uh, could be some supercomputer. There is also a, a, a professor, Rich Schifrin, uh, University of Indiana, who likes to say, this person is yourself, but then you took some medication that made you forget, so it's actually you. Uh, which is also, it, it triggers your, your, your right, you, you have to think a lot through this problem. Um, so if whoever this is decided or predicted that you would take only one box, then they will have put a million dollars in the box. This is a given. There is a direct causal link between the prediction of one box, prediction, and putting a million dollars in there. And if the prediction was made that you would take two boxes, then this person will have put nothing in there. That's also a given. So now, do you take one or two boxes? Who picks one box? Who picks two boxes? Right. So you see, it's a bit divided. If I had given this talk in an institute of theoretical physics or in an institute of economics, everybody would have raised these two, two boxes, uh, the, the hand for two boxes. Uh, but I will explain now why. Um, but the fact that it's divided is general. If you ask people in general, it will be more divided than in for physicists and for economists. Um, so here's the reasoning of those who pick two boxes. Let's call X what is in the uh, closed box. Uh, I assume that whatever I do is independent of X, right? Because it's in the past, it cannot change the past. So let's call it X. I have the choice between X plus 1,000 and X. So obviously I take X plus 1,000, right? And that actually gives me 1,000 uh, because then it's going to be empty probably. But this is the idea, right? And then uh, the other reasoning is that I should pick 1 million. Um, because I'm comparing one million to a thousand. And here I'm thinking, it's different, I'm thinking that if I had picked two boxes, there would have been nothing in there, right? It's a counterfactual consequence. So it seems that both reasoning, both reasonings are correct, right? right? So there, there might be something, that's why it call, it's called a paradox. But actually, if you look deeper into it, as I will explain, the difference is pretty much the same difference as earlier between Nash and uh, Hofstadter, as, as I will explain now. Here's why. 
Because when you make a decision, you're always comparing what you do with what you could have done. What does it mean what you could have done? It's a parallel world, a parallel world in which your decision is different. So above here, that's our world where we are right now. And uh, here I'm th thinking about the two boxer approach, those who pick two boxes. Um, the person is going to take two boxes. The prediction is correct. Alice in the past predicted that Peter, that Bob would take two boxes. But then Bob, to make his decision, is considering the alternative. What if I had taken one box, right? But for the two boxers that I put two or one box, this is independent, right? It doesn't, it doesn't change. So no matter what I take, it's already going to, to have been predicted that I take two boxes, right? I would just make the prediction wrong if I, if I took one box instead. So I'm comparing $1,000 to zero, and thus I take two boxes, right? So this is rational reasoning. So note the fixity of the past, right? So this is the, the free choice uh, in, uh, in that sense that whatever I do is independent of the past. Um, now, the ones who pick one box, this is then the same drawing with the actual world in there. Bob takes one box, uh, and it was predicted that he would take one box. He has free will, but not in the first sense. It's a weakened version of free will in the sense that he could have taken two boxes. So there is an alternate world in which two boxes are taken. But you see that now there is a counterfactual dependency. That's this subjunctive mood, right? If Bob had taken two boxes, Alice would have predicted that Bob would have taken two boxes, right? Be because from the perspective of our world, this is an alternate world. This is called perfect prediction. It means I could have made another choice, but if I had made another choice, the prediction would also have been correct, right? So you look, you're basically looking at all these parallel worlds where you have this counterfactual dependency uh, between the two, right? It's not causal. You cannot have any causal effect to the past. You're just looking at counterfactual dependencies. So now you're comparing a million to a thousand, so you take a million. All right, just to give you, because that's the Newcomb problem, I'm going to do the same thing for the game that, I shown, that I've shown earlier. When we compare with the horizontal line, Bob defects and Alice defects, so they both get one. And now the counterfactual, if Bob had cooperated, Alice would still have defected. This is because you assume it's independent, that's in the Nash equilibrium. So you get one over zero, and thus you defect because that's your best reference to Alice defecting. Now, if I analyze the super rational equilibrium, Bob cooperates and Alice cooperates. We are here, but what does it mean that we are comparing along the diagonal? It means that if Bob had defected, Alice would also have defected. That's a counterfactual dependency, right? So that's, again, the perfect prediction. So you see now we are comparing two to one. Both of them are rational. So you see what difference is there between the two? It's all in the assumption. In this case, we are assuming that we have free will in the sense that we, the past is completely independent from what I'm doing. I cannot change it with my decision, so it's fixed. Then that's the Nash equilibrium. And the non nash uh, uh, reasoning happens when you believe that there is a counterfactual dependency and that if you had made your decision in a different way, it would have been predicted, something else would have happened. So far, so good. Is everybody following? Yes? Okay. So, uh, just a first pointer to literature. Uh, there was, that was a couple of years ago now. Um, this paper, uh, in this paper, I generalized the reasoning of Douglas Hofstadter, which was only for symmetric games, for all games, even when they are not symmetric, right? So this is a generalization called the uh, perfectly transparent equilibrium that's non nashan and it's a generalization because in the case of symmetric games, then you land back on Douglas of Schlatter's equilibrium, right? So it works on non-symmetric games. The only assumption is that there are no ties in the pair. Okay, so we covered one half of uh, game theory, right? The games in normal form. There is another kind of games, a bit more like chess, where you play in turn, right? Civilization. Uh, so if you play in turn, it, mo it looks more like a tree rather than a matrix, just a different kind of game, but you still have this idea of having payoffs in there, right? So here I put Peter first on the left, gets two, Mary gets zero, if that's the outcome of the game. But in order to reach the outcome, there is a ser series of decisions, like a bit like a decision tree, 
Uh, and uh, then it means that Peter go to the right, Mary is here and Peter here, and we reach that outcome, Peter gets two and Mary gets zero. And of course we need to play this. For chess, of course, the size of this would be absolutely gigantic. All right, so that's the game. I'm not going to be showing the resolution on that one because I need to keep it simple to, to, to fit it into the uh, allocated time. So instead I'm going to focus on that game, but you agree it's also a tree, right? It's just a bit simpler, right? It starts here, Peter can go here or here, Mary can go here or here, if she goes here, Peter can go here or here, and so on. That's called the centipede game, uh, this kind of game. Uh, or the take or, or leave game in that, in, in that sense. It's basically the idea that there is a pot on the table, a pot of money, and somebody keeps adding dollars, and you can in turn take it or leave it, right? So if you take it, you take everything, and otherwise the other person gets it, right? Uh, that's kind of the, the, the general explanation. All right. So how do we solve that the Nash way, assuming that there is free choice? Well, you might have heard of the backward induction. When you play chess in that way, you start at the end and then go backwards. You backtrack everything given your anticipation of the path. So we are going to start right there. So uh, Mary has the choice. She's on the right here, three or four. She obviously picks four, right? And that there's she doesn't care about the path because again, that's totally independent, right? Then Peter knows about that. He's simulating maybe Alice. He knows that in the future, if he goes there, Alice would pick that and he would get two. So he would better stop here and instead take three, right? And that is not going to happen, right? Then knowing that Alice here knows that if she was going there, the resolution of that sub game would give her one. She's better off stopping here and getting two. But then Peter knows here that if he would make this decision, he would get zero knowing the resolution of that sub game. So we land here, Peter at the very beginning takes the money from the pot and gets one. This is the Nash equilibrium. It's also called in that case a sub game perfect equilibrium because you resolve the game in every sub game and work your way recursively uh, uh, upwards in the tree. Something very important here because that will be related a bit to quantum theory is that in this Nash equilibrium, these decisions are also defined as hypothetical futures, even though they do not happen because the actual timeline is that Peter stops and we stop here. All of these decisions, they are in their minds, right? But they are still defined, even though they do not happen. I'm just noting that for later. So far so good, who understands the Nash equilibrium? Okay, so that's the Nash resolution. You see, it's not very satisfying, right? Because Peter gets one, but they could have gotten something better here, right? Both of them would have something uh, better. So it's not uh, uh, always Pareto optimal. Then I'm going to give you the non-national version of this to show you the, the thinking behind this. Uh, the uh, seed of that was actually given in the 90s and in the early 2000s by uh, Jean-Pierre Dupuis, who, uh, who is a, a, a professor at Stanford. Um, and, uh, and with whom I worked a little bit at the, at the, at the beginning, taking on, on his ideas. And what he had an, an, as an idea, that's the non-national reasoning, um, is that we should think of the game as happening in a timeline. So you have to play the game and follow a path. The path has to be consistent. So there is some causation in the, in the dynamics of the game. But at the same time, if we assume perfect prediction, meaning that the players anticipate what the resolution of the game what is going to be, and even if the resolution had been different, they would also have anticipated it, that is done national thinking, it turns the whole thing into a fixed point equation. You have to find the outcome of the game that resists its being known in advance. So you know the outcome of the game, you know in advance this is going to happen, and in spite of knowing that it's going to happen, you play towards making it happen. Or even more precisely, the fact that you know it's going to happen causes you to make it happen, also known as a self-fulfilling prophecy. So this is a fixed point equation, and the resolution is all about finding this fixed point that is immune to being known in advance. So in other words, we want to avoid the grandfather's paradox, if you like time travel movies. Uh, so the reasoning is twofold. There are these two principles that I'm going to apply on the game. The first principle says that I am not, if I anticipate an outcome I don't like because if I would deviate, I would get something better. That's called preemption. 
The second principle is that if everything is better here than there, then I'm going to go for the parts that I, that I like, right? But let's, let's put them in practice, much easier. Here's the idea. It's a reductio ad absurdum. I'm, lo I'm looking at a fixed point equation, so I'm just going to eliminate the what is not the fixed points in order to pinpoint the fixed point. Um, in that case, it turns out that we don't go right to left, but left to right somehow. And the idea, the idea is that I'm asking the question, can this be the solution? Can this be the outcome of the game? And everybody knows it in advance. Surely not, right? Because Peter here, if he knew that this were the solution of the game, he would get zero. This is inconsistent because he's rational. He would obviously pick one. So what happened here is a reductio ad absurdum. I'm showing that it's absurd that this could be the solution of the game because Peter would never willingly go there knowing in advance that he would get zero if we can get just one. So we eliminate that. That cannot be a fixed point. Now they integrated in their thinking. Now you notice that here, three, two, five, the only that are left, they are all larger than one. So Peter goes there knowing that zero, two would be inconsistent, right? There is a counterfactual dependency. If Alice would go there, Peter would have known and gone there. It's a grandfather's paradox, right? You travel back to the past and prevent your parents from meeting. So, uh, yeah, I love back to the future. Um, all right, so um, then Alice goes there because of that grandfather's paradox avoidance. Then we do the same thing here. Could this be the solution? No, because if Peter knew that in advance, he would go there and that's incompatible. So reductio ad absurdum. That's not a fixed point. And now five is greater than three. So we go there. This is the, uh, it's called the perfect prediction equilibrium for this kind of game. That's the non-nation resolution. All right, for whom does that make sense? All right, it's again a fixed point equation and I'm just eliminating the outcomes one by one. We have two theorems that actually dates back to 2004, but can you believe it? It took 14 years to get that published because that's uh, uh, away from the mainstream. But we have two theorems. Uh, is that the, uh, so the perfectly transparent equilibrium is just the general name. It's always at most unique. You cannot have multiple of them. There's at most one fixed point. And the second theorem is that it's always Pareto optimal, meaning you will not be stuck in situations like the prisoner's dilemma where you would have another outcome giving more. That cannot happen. It's always optimal. So it's very desirable from an economic perspective. All right. The other paper for extensive form is right there. That's, uh, that's also published. You can read it. It actually was published before the normal form version, uh, but you can also take a look at it. See, it took 14 years from 2004. The only thing we changed there is not the algorithm. This was unchanged for 14 years. It's the pedagogy, the, the way we explained it that we changed. Um, all right. And now I'm getting to quantum. So quantum theory, let me give a 101. Don't worry, you don't need to have the Schrodinger equation or anything because it's a, it's a very particular um, high-level view. First, there's a lot of intuitive thing in quantum theory. For example, one of the most uh, disturbing things that happens is that you throw electrons, which are particles of matter, you throw them through two holes like this. So you would expect to see a first uh, trace here and a second trace here for the two holes, right? No, 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 that's not what you see. You see actually something like interference, the sort of things you see in your living room when the light goes through the curtains. That's very surprising, super surprising. So it seems that there is something new in there and that actually turns the whole field of physics upside down in the 20th century, right? So then there was a huge discussion going in all directions, leading us to a point that we have a theory that works. It's very good at explaining everything. We just do the math and, uh, and, uh, and do it. But we have to deal with superposition and entanglements. The measurement changes the system. When you observe something, it changes the system. Randomness that we have to live with. Spooky action at a distance, that the term coined by Einstein back then uh, in the EPR experiment, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. And Richard Feynman was even quoted to say that, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics, right? He was very good in his lecture. Um, and to make it worse, we even have impossibility theorems that deny us some principles that uh, uh, before were assumed as obvious, such as when you look at something, it's just there. You look at it and you see it, realism. And locality, means, which means that nothing can propagate faster than light, right? It's spooky action at a distance. And this is gone. We, we don't have that anymore. We have to, to get rid of that somehow. So that's, uh, that's 
absolutely terrible, and Einstein actually uh, was fighting against this. Like, there has to be a, a better way, right? We were just missing something. Um, so I'm going to try to defend Einstein's view and, and to show you that there is actually a better way. And I'm going, of course, to give you arguments because I'm just not going to wave in the air. So I hope that these arguments will make sense. So who heard of a quantum measurement? Who heard of collapse of the wave function? That's the terrible thing that happens when you look at something, bam, just collapses. So here it's kind of a superposition of multiple places, something called as the wave function. It's some sort of uh, probability amplitude, except that it has colors there, known as the face. Um, and then, bam, you look at it, it's there, and you know that's collapse. That's one of the ways, not everybody sees it that way, but that's one of the ways of seeing it, is that nature makes a choice about some position, and that's it, and now you see it, and it's, it's there. Uh, and it seems to be random. We cannot do anything else than say, okay, with some probability, like this is the density function, the square of that, actually, but this is the density function, and then it gives you a probability, then you toss a coin and get that, right? And that's the, the thing that disturbed Einstein, and that disturbs me too. Um, now, how can we abstract away? Because, of course, you can read the whole quantum physics book and look at the equations of the photons, the electrons, the, the, the all, 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 the, all the terminology, but there is a field known as quantum foundations where we kind of abstract it away. One of the abstractions is that we think in terms of qubits, so just zero and one simplifies a lot compared to an infinity of position. And then we just look at it from outside. I don't know you, but I've never seen a wave function. I've never seen uh, a quantum state. What I've seen, however, is some knobs that I can turn to make a measurement, and then I can read the result somewhere. That I have seen. These are the classical bits. The quantum is just underneath. We don't see it. We can have a theory that explains it. But the only thing we observe and based on which we derive our theories is based on this. So the idea when you measure, when you prepare an experiment is that you prepare a system, you spit out some electrons or photons or protons or whatever. You turn some knobs to, uh, to select a setting. For example, you measure a spin on the x or z axis to so make a choice. Then you see a result. Maybe it's up, maybe it's down. I put one and minus one in there, right? Uh, and then you record it uh, to some uh, medium, maybe in an Excel spreadsheet or in some file or on some textbook, but you write it down somewhere, classical, uh, classical bits. All right, so this is the abstraction that we're going to have. So there is a setting, there is a result. Now, I just wanted to show you the, rich, the Richard Feynman version of this because he actually gave plenty of wonderful lectures and this is how he draws this, right? So you, you, you push a button there, that's your knob, and you see a light bulb that either switches on or doesn't. So that's just to show you the, the level of abstraction that, uh, that uh, we have here. You make a choice on what to look at, setting, push, turn a knob or push buttons, and then you see the result on some screen or a light bulb that switches on or off. Now, uh, I'm just giving a bit of food for, uh, food for thought for the physicist. Who is a physicist? We have some. So I need to basically be a bit more formal and make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. So here I'm referring to a paper published right here at uh, uh, ETH, uh, is the uh, Institute of Theoretical Physics. Um, so the idea is that if you look at a local experiment, what you have is you make a measurement. So this is my setting here, and this is my outcome there. But you need to feed a quantum state in there. That's what I don't see, but it, it's the input. And then you make a measurement, turn the knob with a specific setting that you pick, get a result, and then you spit out something uh, to the outside world. I'm giving you the fancy words. Don't worry, everybody else. My input and output quantum state is a density matrix in the linear space corresponding to the Hilbert space. My measurement setting is just a classical value, and my measurement outcome is a classical value. And what is in the middle mapping all of that to this is called a CPTV map, completely positive trace preserving map. I'm not going to explain what that is, but I know that the physicists get what I mean, right? And uh, in this paper, in the original paper that is actually here, it's not done in that way, but in this paper, it's reformulated by feeding the classical uh, as part of the input like this and having the CPTV map work on everything, right? I, I think it's a, it's a very nice way of putting it, right? But basically, this is what we have. We have the local lab. Now let's look at two labs, Alice's lab and Bob's lab. So now I'm going to have a lab right here and right there. And I can connect them. For example, I can see that Alice is before Bob, and the output 
state of Alice goes to Bob, right? And again, these are my two nodes. These are my two outcomes, right? I could also connect them in that way, right? Prepare some entangled uh, particles, and I ship one over to Alice and the other to Bob. They're entangled. And then they just do their measurements very far away from each other so that they can't communicate. So we this is what we would get. Again, I have my two settings and my two outputs there. Now, what we are interested in, because that's the only thing I can actually observe, is the statistical distribution of my outcomes, x1 and x2, conditions on specific choices of settings, right? So uh, are there students of mine in formation retrieval who saw, yeah, I, I put it the right way, right? So really explicitly the random variable, the classical variable, and so on. You can also write it this way, which might be a bit more compact. So it's really the probability of getting these two values conditioned on the fact that uh, we get these two values. Now, what is that actually? If I do it a million times, I'm going to lock that to some book, right? I keep records. Then I aggregate, and what I get is a table like this. If you're familiar with Bayesian networks, that actually shouldn't surprise you. But basically, I have the value of this, the conditional probability of the two outcomes conditioned on the settings. And here, maybe I can collect the statistics of that, the frequency. It only sums up to one within each choice of the settings, right? So this sums up to one, this, this, and this separately. This is the case where uh, we have an entangled particle, and uh, I think we measure on X or Z on the left, and on the right it's some more complex thing, but basically it gives us these probabilities right there, this distribution right here. Now, you could also do a different experiment and just don't use quantum state and just toss a coin, right? And then you just get a quarter probability, 0 0.25 everywhere, right? So these are just two experiments. You can just do whatever experiment you want. Then you log the values in there, the probabilities. Now, there is a criterion that's the bell inequality. The bell inequalities, actually, there's plenty of them. Um, it's a way to detect quantumness. It's a way to say, okay, here that cannot have been uh, something non-quantum, cannot be something classical. So I just threw the formula at you like that, which applies under two assumptions. Free choice, same that I explained earlier, your choice of settings is independent, or the, the past uh, is not, sorry, let me explain it precisely. Your choice of setting can only be correlated to stuff in the future, not the past and the present. And local realism is the idea that nothing propagates faster than light, uh, and measurement outcomes are pre-existing. The two are tied, actually. In the original paper, there is an argument that this kind of implies uh, that with free choice. Anyway, but I don't want you to be scared that that formula, so I have a better way of explaining that. So your, your detector of, uh, of, uh, of uh, quantumness just consists in adding up the purple uh, cells in there, and you look, is that greater than one? Uh, if it's greater than one, then that could have been classical. If it's smaller than one, then that's not possible that it's classical. There has to be a quantum, uh, a quantum thing in there. And we know that this happens in nature, that it's smaller than one. We know that nature breaks the bell inequalities, and this is what Alain Aspe proved earlier. So now, uh, if we do that with the classical setting, I find something greater than one. Great. Nothing, uh, nothing uh, uh, to, to write home about. Now, if somebody comes to me and pretends that they run this experiment just with coins and uh, coins and dice, and they give me that table, I'm going to say, no, 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 there's no way you could have done that with coins and, uh, uh, coins and dice, because if I sum up all of these numbers in the purple cells, I get 0 0.59. So there has to be something that is non-classical, right? So that's the idea. But you see that everything there is just based on my probabilities or statistical distribution in my output. So now, how do I move on to maybe uh, uh, an alternate way based on game theory to, uh, to, to potentially explain that sort of quantum mess? Well, I could draw what's called the causal diagram here. So I'm giving that uh, again as food for those who for whom that makes sense. So A1, the, the, the choice of setting causes the, 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 the outcome because it's in the past, and you will also see a lambda that kind of have been some state of the past that influences both outcomes, right? What's important is that A1 and A2, they are called exogenous. They are not influenced by anything. They are just freely chosen. I'm going to remove lambda because I'm focusing on this for, for non-Nation approach. The first thing I'm going to do is duplicate the choices. Why do I do that? Because I have information 
here, that's the, the, the choice by the universe of the outcome, knowing that the knob was on zero, and here it's the choice knowing that it was on one. So I basically pretend, okay, these are two different choices. So this is like a game, that's called a space-time game, actually. And you see, what are the possibilities here? This is a possible outcome, this, 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 I'm just listing all the possibilities here. There are basically 16 possibilities. It turns out that I can represent this in that way as a game. See, it's game theory again with the settings and the outcomes. The payoffs here are, are three parameters of the model. I can put whatever I want, and it's future work to actually know what to put in there. Actions, for example, nature minimizes action. And then you will find that in the paper, the space-time game and so on, just giving you the reference. If you solve it in the Nash way, uh, you will find this equilibrium, but look, it has locality all over the place, right? Because the, this is uh, when I say that I cannot distinguish between this and this with the dashed line, that's because I'm far away from it, so I cannot know the result here. It has realism all over the place because this here is the results of the measurements that are predefined, right? And then you go to there and read the, uh, the results. But it's not Nash because if I deviate, I will always find something less, so 10, is better than nine, so the deviation doesn't give me anything, right? And all the deviations that I try, I always find something less good. That's why it's a Nash equilibrium, right? Even that, that doesn't even impact anything. So this is why we have a Nash equilibrium. But you see, we have here free choice and local realism. So in the, in the paper, we established a link with the Bell inequalities that it's not possible to break them. It's not possible to explain quantumness with Nash equilibrium. You will find more in this paper that I co-authored with uh, one of my assistants, uh, Michal Banchik, who worked with me during the pandemic. He did a lot of stuff on Zoom. All right, and now the non-national resolution, just the animation. The idea is that uh, you do the same elimination that I told you and you eliminate what is not possible. Here you eliminate this one because you would always get something better here. And you just work your way like this, eliminating, and you see there's an elapse of time here. Right, that leads all the way with a forward induction to some result. And here we have local realism, but we don't have national free choice. We have the reduced free choice, as I explained earlier. And so I like this quote of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in Sherlock Holmes, which basically says, how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, all the outcomes that are not fixed points, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth the actual world in which we are, and the result of the experiments that we carry out. Uh, the algorithm for resolving the game is in a separate paper that you will find here. It's also all explained with the algorithms, formulas, and so on, how to solve in a non-nation way. There could be other non-nation solution concepts, right? It's, it's just one of them. And in order to finish this talk, I would like to give you an intuition on this idea of causation, counterfactuals, correlations, with the idea that you can think of this whole thing uh, as space-time, but you add a dimension to parallel worlds. Like, who knows the Sliders series? It's an awesome series from the 90s, 2000s. They open a vortex and travel to parallel worlds, and this could be seen as an extra uh, 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 set of dimensions here, which are the going to the parallel worlds. And so on the very, very high level, in a way, time is linked to relativity theory that revolutionized causality, space to information theory that revolutionize correlations. Why? Because the correlations are about something that is logged in a textbook. It's stored on a hard drive. So this is on space. And HAP, that's what I call the other dimension because of happenstance, is about quantum physics that revolutionize counterfactuals. It's all about counterfactuals, right? I measure up, Alice measures down. If I had measured down, she would have measured up. That's a counterfactual dependency. So this is the, uh, the summary here. Interestingly, these three causal counterfactual statistical, I believe they should be different. That's what I strongly argue, but a lot of people confuse them. The easy one is causal correlations. You've seen this chocolate versus Nobel Prize thing, so everybody knows correlation is not causation, right? But the other two is not so obvious, right? Because we have a lot of people who kind of define causation, information, sh information theoretically, uh, with counterfactuals, right? Something causes something else if when you change the first, it changes the second, right? That's a counterfactual. Um, and the third one, counterfactuals and dependencies, I had a student, Emilian Piu, who worked with me. Uh, uh, it's about 
the difference between conditional probabilities, indicative mood, and counterfactual, probabilities of subjunctive conditionals. That's what this means here. Um, and in, in a way, one easy way of summing that up, that I heard sometimes in the community, uh, it's not by me, is the idea that you try to work with probabilities in the quantum world, but there is no omega space. You, you cannot patch together all of the mini omega spaces into a single one, so somethi something's odd. And I think the reason is that these are not conditional probabilities, these are probabilities of subjunctive counterfactuals. Um, so the idea, what motivates me in there is quotes like this by, by uh, Bell, uh, because a lot of people interpret the Bell inequalities as showing that Einstein was wrong, you cannot have hidden variables or local realism, but he said, long made with a boy who invented a theory that uh, is non-local, continue to inspire those who suspect that what is proved by impossibility proves his lack of imagination. That's a very inspiring uh, quote. But in short, I mean, the argument we have is very simple. There are two assumptions for Bell inequalities, free choice and local realism, right? But since there are two assumptions, most people drop local realism, no hidden variables, we do the opposite. We think there is local realism, uh, it's all predefined in a way that we can uh, predict, but it could have been different if we made different choices, so we do have a weakened form of free choice. We just decide to drop the other assumption to the Bell inequalities rather than the first one. Right? So I would like to thank all of the students who have been working with me uh, uh, in uh, various projects. So this, is, uh, this was really instrumental to, uh, to uh, uh, all, of these, uh, all of these results. Right? So if you're interested, you can read the papers or uh, we can maybe have some questions now to, uh, to uh, uh, take it further. So thank you very much for um, following. Thank you very much, Isla, for this very interesting talk. So we have time for only a few questions, but I hope you're still around outside if yes. people have some more questions. Absolutely. So let's take, like, I think, three questions, depending on how complicated they are and how long they take to answer. Uh, so at the end, you mentioned that you are able to retain um, realism. And by assuming this counterfactual that if it were different, it could have been different, C can you interpret this similar to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics? Yes, I can explain that in context. Actually, I dropped another 100 slides that talk about that, but that, that I could not put in there in the interest of time. Um, the way that I think about how it fits with the many worlds interpretation is that uh, when you have a game like that, these are all the many worlds. They all appear here. But the many world interpretation has some symmetry between the worlds. These are all possibilities, and we just happen to be in one of the worlds, seems random, and there are all the other worlds that could have been. What this adds, this model, it's a model because again, you need to instantiate the parameters, so it's only a model. The idea is that it builds on top of the many worlds by pinpointing one of these worlds as being the world in which we are. So this is asymmetric because there is really one of these that is the actual world. But in essence, it works on top of the many worlds, but it eliminates all of the worlds that are inconsistent uh, in, in this setting, and that uh, only leaves one, at most one. So it would be closer to the Feynman's path integral in interpretation? Where yes, yeah. exactly. That's exactly the idea. That's exactly what it is, and there is, there is a direct link uh, with, with this idea. Yeah. Any more questions? Sorry, maybe for having missed something, but at the end I didn't understand. Are we free to choi to to make a choice, or not? <laughs> <So> <laughs> because if 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 it, it is because we were going to choose that, it was given also given this realism or however you want to call it, because I think there was a little bit mix in the concepts. This also implies our choice or not. This was not clear for mm -hmm. me. Thank you very much. So. Free choice is something that we are kind of emotionally attached to, right? So we, we, we kind of want to, to, to hold on to it. Um, what I'm interested in is the mathematical definitions of free choice. The mathematical definition that you commonly found, find of free choice in the, in the quantum foundations literature is in terms of the decision, the freely chosen decision, can only be correlated to the future. 
they cannot be any correlations uh, to the to the past or to uh, to other um, to the to space like separated uh, places um, what the non nation version of free choice means it's a, it's a weaker assumption that is also called if if you know quantum foundations you might know it as full support it's full support it means that there exists a world in which every choice is taken i make that choice to drink coffee in our world there is a world somewhere where I drink tea. That is my weakened version of free choice. I could have made a different decision, but it's compatibilistic in the sense that I could have made that different decision, but I could have been predicted. So I drink coffee. Everybody knew I would drink coffee. I could have drunk tea instead, and it would have been predicted that I would have drunk tea. Right. So thi this is the idea. I weaken free choice. Uh, many people have worked in a binary fashion, either I'm free or I'm not, right? So if we don't have this free choice uh, in the national way, it's super deterministic. But what we argue is, no, there is room in the middle for something that is neither determ super deterministic. Uh, we, we still have retained some free choice and are responsible for our decisions, but it's also not to the point that our, 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 our decisions are totally unpredictable. Right? Th did that make sense? It's really the math that uh, that uh, that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Ah, let me. So let me explain. Yeah. So. So let me explain that because I, I that that's what Jean-Pierre Dupuis already 20 years ago wa was uh, was arguing. We need to distinguish between two models for prediction. There is what he called ad hoc prediction. Ad hoc prediction means in my world, in the actual world, the prediction is correct. But in parallel world, it might have been incorrect. So it's, a, it's just in this world here, the prediction is correct. Perfect prediction uh, means that the prediction is correct in all worlds, in the, same that there is the sense that there is this counterfactual dependence between the, the decision and the prediction. So there are several ways of, of defining uh, prediction, right? And, uh, and this it's very important to model that. In game theory, this is known as necessary rationality in terms of model logic, right? There's a quantifier on all possible worlds versus only assuming it in our worlds, right? Does it make sense? Yes, I, I totally understand. Okay, <laughs> yeah, we can continue <laughs> the conversation after that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to have yeah, debates yeah. and yeah, every debate strengthens the argument, so I always welcome this. <laughs> So, uh, unfortunately, these were, uh, or not unfortunately, they were very interesting answers, but we are out of time, so I uh, uh, cannot take the promised third question. Um, so, what well, leaves me to give you a little token of our That's appreciation. Oh yes, wow. we, we, we oh don't wow. have... We don't have two ch two boxes. We only have mm -hmm. one cup. Oh, that's um, very so one boxer. <laughs> I pick one box, so that's yes. actually perfect. <laughs> and it's not a choice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Thank you very um, much, Manuel. Uh, and you uh, have a nice rest of FISCON. Don't forget to um, uh, review the talks if you want. It helps us. It also may help Shizla. Um, and yes, go to your next talks. Have fun. Thank you.